If you want to better appreciate 1 Corinthians 14, 34 to 35, what it means and what it doesn't mean, then what we need to do is see who the intended audience happens to be and why Paul is even mentioning and raising and addressing these issues. All right, 1 Corinthians 14, 34 to 35. Okay, let's read. Now let's see if you catch it. Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. I don't know how many of you caught it. Even if you want to take this passage to mean women cannot say anything at all in any circumstance or situation, it's referring to a specific group of women. Who caught it? Let's see who catches, who's paying attention and studying the scriptures. This is why you guys got to read. Thank you, Billy. It's talking to married women. That means at most you're proving that only married women should be silent, not unmarried ones. So even this passage in its context is not speaking of all kinds of women. It's speaking of a specific group of women, married ones. So the most this passage proves is that married women should be silent. So you guys are not reading carefully. So the most you prove from 1 Corinthians 14, 34, 35, the most is only married women should be silent. But even then, that's not his point. Well, Sylvia, it's not what you see. It's what the text says. What does the text say? Let them ask their husbands at home. So he's not talking about all women or women in general because women are not married. Who are they going to ask? Because he's not addressing that. He was addressing disruptive wives who are creating chaos, confusion, and division in the church because they're promoting disorderly conduct in the church. Because can you explain to me why that comment was necessary that most women were married? When we just read in 1 Corinthians 7, there were many virgin girls at that church who are not married yet in 1 Corinthians 7. Lord Jesus, have mercy and forgive us all. Okay. Did you guys remember in 1 Corinthians 7, Paul was talking about virgin girls who are betrothed to get married. And he says to those virgin girls that it's better they don't get married in light of their present crises. Right? So what point did it serve for this to tell me most women were married? Is that he's addressing married women. So he leaves the issue of unmarried women open. So right there, you're learning how not to interpret the Bible and how to interpret the Bible. We're going to read now the context. Now let's start 1 Corinthians 14, 26 to 36. Let's read. Read with me. The context. How is it then, brethren, when ye come together, every one of you hath a psalm, hath a doctrine. Every one of you has a psalm that they want to sing, has a teaching they want to share, hath a tongue. They want to say something in a particular language, hath a revelation and interpretation. Let all things be done unto edifying. Make sure whatever you do, whatever you say, it's to build up the church, strengthen the church and their love for Jesus, not tear down. Now, pay attention, please. If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two or at the most three. And that by course, meaning one at a time. And let one interpret. It's got to be interpreted so everyone understands and benefits. But if there be no interpreter, pay attention to the word silence. But if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church. I want you, please, in Jesus' name, remember this word silence. It's the same word used for women. Okay? Same word used for women. In the church, and let him speak to himself and to God. Now watch here. Let the prophets speak two or three. If you have prophets who want to proclaim, two or three the most. Right? Two or three the most. Right? <clears throat> And let the other judge, if it's truly a prophetic word. If anything be revealed to another man, another that sitteth by, let the first hold his peace. So if a man during that time is receiving revelation right there from the Spirit, the one speaking, be silent. Let this man stand up and speak because the Spirit's prompting him to speak. Okay. For ye may all prophesy one by one, one at a time, that all may learn and be comforted. Okay, now 32 and 33. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. You have control over that revelation, that ecstatic speech. It doesn't control you because the Holy Spirit gives you the strength to control it. So you don't add 
chaos and confusion, but <clears throat> promote unity <clears throat> and build up the body. Now notice 43. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. You see what the point is in the passage? Guys, you understand? 33 is the key. The point in the passage is we want orderly worship. God is not a God of confusion. He doesn't cause people to speak out of turn, speak different languages that no one understands. So it's chaos and confusion and no one gets built up. He's not a God of chaos, of disorder. He's a God of peace. This is the context. This is the context. For God is not the author of confusion, meaning chaos, disorder, division. That's what the word means. But of peace, of order, of unity. Let's read 34, 35, and we'll post it one more time. Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. What? Came the word God out from you? Did it originate from you? Or came it unto you only? Or are you the only one that receives the word of God? Is it clear what the context is now? Is it clear what the context is? The context is about a church in chaos and disorder. People speaking out of turns. Speak, people speaking in tongues. No one understanding. Women disrupting the service by asking questions out of turn and causing chaos and confusion. That's the point of Paul. Paul is addressing a specific need, <clears throat> plaguing a specific church at a specific location. In this church, people were speaking in tongues out of turn and no one interpreting so that the rest could not understand. So they were not being built up. In this church, people were standing up and speaking out of turn, causing chaos, confusion, and no one was being edified. In this church, there were married women. Married women speaking out of turn, asking questions, adding to disruption and confusion, not promoting unity and peace and understanding. That's the context. Now, the word silence used, silence. So Cindy Gullian, notice what you said. Sounds like some of the church you've been to. That means now 1 Corinthians 14 applies to them. Though it was written to the Corinth, it still has meaning for us today because we still need to follow that orderly structure of worship. So the whole Bible is for all Christians in all generations until the Lord returns. But it was written to specific communities with specific needs. See, thank you, Sharon DeCruz. You see now why 1 Corinthians 14 would apply to your situation. Because unfortunately, nothing new under the sun. And in every generation of Christians, we still have carnal-minded infants or unbelievers in sheep's clothing coming and creating chaos, bringing division, destroying the order of the church. So 1 Corinthians 14 is still applicable and must be enforced. Go and see that the same Greek word used by Paul to say, women, be silent. Okay, be silent. That same Greek word, right, is used in verse 28 and 30. Verses 28 and 30. So the same Greek word, sigao, sigao, sigao. Now let's read. But if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence. Notice what Paul is saying. You will speak in tongues. If no one interprets, be silent. Same word, 1 Corinthians 14, 30. If anything be revealed, to another that sitteth, but let the first hold his peace. Let the first be silent. So the one who is prophesying, be silent. And now, what does it say about the woman? Let your woman keep silence in the churches. See, same thing. You speaking in tongues. Be silent if you don't have someone interpreting. You who happen to be prophesying. If someone receives a revelation right there, be silent, let him speak. You marry women, be silent. Now, does this mean that Paul is saying married women cannot contribute anything in the church? Or is he speaking in the context of married women disrupting the church and promoting chaos and confusion? And he says, be silent. Don't ask a question. 
and disrupt the service, ask your husbands at home and they'll clarify. So Paul is no more forbidding women from speaking as he's forbidding prophets from prophesying as he's forbidding people who speak in tongues to speak in tongues publicly. Paul is no more forbidding married women from speaking in the church as he's preventing prophets from prophesying in the church. Understand what the point is now? Understand what the point is now? The point is there's a particular group of married women causing disruption and confusion in the church at Corinth, adding to chaos and confusion. As our prophets speaking out of turn, and one prophet not respecting the other prophet who's receiving a fresh revelation at that moment by the Spirit to share, and just sitting back and letting that person speak, or people speaking in tongues without interpreting and therefore edifying no one. That's what he's address addressing. That women can pray and prophesy in the church. That married woman, married woman can pray and prophesy in the church. Again, is confirmed by 1 Corinthians 11. Are we ready now for the icing of the cake to settle this issue once and for all to know what women can and cannot do in the church? That Paul in the same epistle, that same letter, that same epistle shows that married women can pray and prophesy and therefore speak in the local body and don't have to be silent Let's go to 1 Corinthians 11, verses 3 to 10. The benefit of the doubt. He's essentially saying that in this particular scenario, which is a woman speaking in church, and he'll elaborate on it more, a woman inherently has less of value to offer than a man. And thus, it would behoove her to just be quiet and defer to the men in this scenario. Of course not. Folks, can I ask you a question? Does God expect and command married women to pray? Or do married women not pray and they just shut up, sit there and be mute? Is it the duty of married women to pray to God, to sing to God, to worship God, and to even teach specifically their own children? If that's the case, then 1 Corinthians 11 is clearly teaching Women who are married can pray and prophesy like men. Husbands pray and prophesy and their wives pray and prophesy. So Paul is not saying that women who are married cannot pray, cannot prophesy. They must pray and prophesy like men must pray and prophesy. And together they can pray and prophesy. But wait, if that's what Paul is saying, then is Paul contradicting himself in 1 Corinthians 14 when he says married women remain silent in the churches. Pay attention here. Paul says women who are married can pray and prophesy as long as their head is covered. But then in 1 Corinthians 14, 34, 35 says women be silent in the church and ask your husbands. Is that a contradiction? Because for a woman to pray, she can't be silent in the church. For a woman to prophesy, prophesying, the Greek word means to proclaim. Proclaiming the word of God. How can she proclaim God's word in the church? How can she pray if she's to be altogether silent? So either Paul is contradicting himself. And for married women to pray and prophesy, that means they are speaking in the church, speaking aloud in mixed company in the congregation. So how can married women be completely silent? It was only to specific women that were causing disruption. Pay attention to this. 1 Corinthians 7 verse 1. Pay attention, folks. I need you to read this passage. Notice what Paul says. One more time. Now concerning the things whereof ye wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Okay, did you guys catch it or did it go over our heads? Now concerning the things whereof ye wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Do you see the context? Paul is saying, you Corinthians, the church at Corinth, wrote to me a series of questions. And now I'm answering those questions. And obviously by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So you see the point? 
He's addressing questions, challenges, issues, plaguing a church at that time at a location called Corinth. So if you don't understand that he's responding to questions, questions of which we don't have, but we can get an idea and clue what those questions were. Do any of you have that letter that the Corinthians wrote to Paul with their questions and issues and challenges? Does anyone have it? Does anyone have that list of questions, that letter? Of course not. So what does this tell you off the bat? What does this tell you off the bat? First Corinthians was written to address the questions, the issues, the concerns of a particular Christian group living at a particular time in a particular location. Therefore, 1 Corinthians 14, 34 to 35, right? has an historical context. He's addressing a situation plaguing that church at that time. Is that making sense? So when I want to understand what 1 Corinthians 14, 34, and 35 is all about, I have to take into consideration this, this is addressing a particular group of Christians, a particular group of women living in a particular location at a particular time, and then once I properly understand his point, what he means and what he doesn't mean, then I can see how it applies to Christians in the 21st century by the power of the Holy Spirit for the glory of Jesus Christ. Another example. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 7, 25 to 26. Let's read. 1 Corinthians 7, 25. Now concerning virgins, I have no commandment of the Lord, yet I give my judgment as one that hath obtained mercy of the Lord to be faithful. I suppose, therefore, that this is good for the present distress. I say that is good for a man so to be. He's addressing an issue that doesn't concern us today necessarily. He's addressing an issue about whether virgins who were betrothed should be married off or should they remain virgins and not get married. And then he says, in light of your present distress, what distress? In light of your present crises, the tribulation that you're undergoing, it's more fitting and better for you not to get married. What distress? What crises? Right? What tribulation? What virgins? You see, this is not written to you. Is that making sense? 1 Corinthians 14, 34, 35 is not written to you. It's written to those Christians who had particular issues and problems and he's addressing. But it does have meaning for us today. For example, here's the principle you can extract from 7, 25, 26. If Christians are living in a time where they're being persecuted, imprisoned, tortured, and killed, in light of that, it's easier for a Christian not to get married because when you get married, it may add, add to the burden of remaining a faithful witness to Christ because it's easier as a single man to be willing to die for Jesus than it is to be a father and a husband and then have someone threaten me that they're going to kill my children before my eyes if I don't deny Jesus. So that's what Paul is saying. In light of your situation, in light of your crises, in light of your issues, it's best you don't get married because it'll be easier for you to suffer tribulation and endure persecution without caving into temptation to deny the Lord Jesus Christ. So now this passage would have meaning for Christians in China. It would be applicable for Christians in Iraq, in Syria, who are being tortured, imprisoned, beaten, enslaved, and or murdered or raped. And this is not the only time where God spoke through an inspired emissary instructing individuals, in light of your situation, it's better you remain celibate and single. God told Jeremiah the very same thing. Jeremiah chapter 16, verses 1 to 4. The word of Jehovah came also unto me, saying, Thou shalt not take thee a wife. Notice, a celibate prophet. So the word told Jeremiah, You will not take a wife, neither shalt thou have sons or daughters in this place, Jerusalem. For thus saith Jehovah concerning the sons and concerning the daughters that are born in this place, and concerning their mothers that bear them, right, and concerning their fathers that begat them in this land. They shall die of grievous deaths. They shall not be lamented, neither shall they be buried, but they shall be as dung upon the face of the earth, 
and they shall be consumed by the sword and by famine, and their carcasses shall be meat for the fowls of heaven and for the beasts of the earth. You see what God is doing? Jeremiah, I'm going to spare you the pain, the heartache. Because my people's sin are so great, I'm going to bring in nations headed by the king of Babylon to destroy the city and the temple and destroy its inhabitants. So I want to spare you from the pain of seeing your wife and children killed before your eyes or dying of famine. Now, does that mean this instruction for Jeremiah or the instruction that Paul gave to the Christians in Corinth that virgins don't get married, men remain celibate, is applicable for all Christians at all times? Clear, right? If that is clear and it makes sense, we're going to re-examine 1 Corinthians 14, 34 to 35 again. I hope this is blessing you, educating you, helping you understand the scriptures with greater depth by the power of the Holy Spirit and appreciate more as we fall more passionately in love with the Lord Jesus Christ. Boy, do I struggle with confidence issues. By the way, honest confession. You may think I'm just saying it. People think I'm very confident and aggressive like an alpha male. No, that's because the Holy Spirit emboldens me and gives me the grace to be bold for the glory of Jesus. Outside of that, psh, boy, whew, 